the final battleship to be completed by Imperial Germany, SMS Baden was a powerful warship. Certainly the most powerful that the High Seas Fleet would ever take into service, though by that point, it was into a service where she could do very little. The Royal Navy had not just recovered from Jutland, but was in fact in an even stronger position than they had been before it. The High Seas Fleet, by contrast, was in more or less the same position. Save for Baden and her sister anyway, though two battleships armed with 15-inch guns were arrayed against 10 battleships and four battlecruisers, as questionable as courageous and glorious were, armed with similar weapons. Nonetheless, Baden is an interesting ship and worth looking at, albeit less for her service with her homeland and more for what the British would do with her after the Great War came to an end. The title is there for a reason, after all. First, though, her limited service with Germany, and her technical details, must be covered. Laid down on December 20th, 1913, SMS Baden was the second of the Bayern-class battleships. These were the final word on Imperial German battleship design, at least as far as completed ships go. Designed as a counter to other navies bringing 13.5 and 14-inch guns into service, these battleships were intended to keep the German fleet competitive with foreign advancements. Germany did succeed in surpassing the 13.5 and 14-inch gun. However, the British soon brought out a 15-inch gun of their own with the Queen Elizabeth and Revenge, so the theoretical advantage was short-lived. Even so, Baden was an impressive ship for her day and age. Displacing 32,200 tons at full load, she carried a main battery of eight 38 centimeter guns. These are generally considered 15-inch guns, but are more accurately 14.96-inch rifles, though they often just get rounded up for understandable reason. In any case, the eight guns were carried in four twin turrets, mounted in the typical layout of two fore and two aft in super-firing pairs. Initially only able to elevate to 16 degrees, the ships had a relatively short range as a result. This was in keeping with German doctrine, expecting close-in combat in the North Sea. They were quickly modified, however, to increase the elevation to 20 degrees and the range to around 23,000 meters. The remainder of her designed weaponry consisted of 16 15 centimeter 5.9 inch guns mounted in casements around the superstructure. In addition to this, her anti-aircraft battery consisted of 2 to 4 88 millimeter guns, though sources do seem to differ on which number was actually fitted. The final weapons were the traditional submerged torpedo tubes, in this case five of them, one on the bow and two on either broadside. As for armor protection, this was of a very traditional German model, being fairly similar to the preceding dreadnoughts. The main armor belt, covering machinery and magazine spaces, was the same 350mm thick. Her deck armor was similar in this regard, ranging from 60 to 100 millimeters, that is 2.4 to 3.9 inches, depending on how important the area of the ship was. When it came to speed, this is a touchier subject. The stated design speed was 21 knots, fairly typical for the time. Bonin managed 22.1 knots on her trials, which is impressive, but sea trials rarely match up exactly to service speed. However, there are claims that the Germans ran their trials in less than ideal conditions. That had they run the trials in more normal circumstance, and with better coal, the ships could have made as much as 23 or even 24 knots. With the techie bits done now, we can move on to her admittedly short service life. Baden was launched on October 30th, 1915, with the Great War sucking up German resources like you wouldn't believe. As a direct result, her fitting out process was consistently delayed as steel and other such resources went to the army or the U-boats. Baden would, as such, only enter service on March 14, 1917. Even her sea trials, when the ship could have been pressed into action had it become necessary, took place from October 1916 to January 1917. As you can probably tell, that is well too late to participate in any grand fleet battles. She missed Jutland by almost a full year, and the German fleet would never again engage the British 
in such a massive brawl. Her crew might have been equal parts angered and relieved by this, being as they, and her first captain, were survivors from SMS Lutso. In keeping with this, Bonin also took Lutso's place as flagship of Franz von Hipper, and for that matter, the entire High Seas Fleet. And, once again, at this point in the war, there wasn't much for her to do in her role as flagship. When the most notable thing she did in 1917 was carting the Kaiser around, you know that the battleship didn't have much to do. Her sister would at least get to spar with the Russians, but Baden missed that. She largely sat at the dockside, or performed training duties, only rarely doing anything more notable than that. At least until April 1918, so about a year after she formally entered service, anyway. At that point, the High Seas Fleet made one final swing at engaging the Grand Fleet. Or rather, a portion of it. German cruiser and destroyer raids on British convoys to Norway had compelled the Royal Navy to detach battleships to escort their convoys. This was what the Germans really wanted, a chance to nail part of the Grand Fleet and wear it down. So it was on April 23, 1918, that the High Seas Fleet set sail once more. The fleet was under orders to avoid wireless transmissions, to avoid the British cluing in and sortying the entire Grand Fleet. This went well enough at first, until the battlecruiser Moltke conspired to drop one of her starboard propellers off. As a result, she had to be taken in tow and returned to port. The Germans, meanwhile, had actually missed the convoy entirely, as it left port a day later than they had been expecting. After this, Baden returned to carting around dignitaries, this time Admiral Scheer and the Grand Duke of Baden, and training missions. August would find her in dry dock before the last major training exercise began in September. It would also be her last time sailing with the High Seas Fleet as a whole. Come October, Scheer and Hipper began to plan the death ride of the High Seas Fleet. The entire navy would sortie in one go, and no matter how much of the Grand Fleet came out to party, engage in in battle. It was fully expected that the fleet would be mauled, and it was fully expected that many would die. It was a mix of frustration, a desire to get better peace terms by wrecking the Royal Navy, and a plain desire to preserve the honor of the fleet. A classic thought by fleet commanders, completely out of touch with the men expected to do the actual fighting and dying. These men would, instead of sailing to their certain, and very much pointless, death, mutiny. It began on October 29, 1918, and would eventually spread to most of the major ships in the fleet. Baden herself, still the flagship, would see a socialist red flag raised on November 9, 1918. It was taken, in addition to the ship and dockside revolts, as a sign to not go through with the operation though as it would turn out Germany would sign the armistice in a couple days anyway. So it would be that the High Seas Fleet never set sail again, at least not as an actual combat formation. Instead it would sail for Scapa Flow at the end of November to be interned as peace negotiations progressed. I've seen it referenced that Baden was not intended to be surrendered at first, and was only substituted for the incomplete Mackinson later on. As a result, she was late on her arrival to Scapa Flow, not arriving until January 7th, 1919. This delay allowed the Germans to strip out all of her valuable equipment, leaving her without most of her gunnery gear, as an example. Regardless, she would arrive, and would be present when the German fleet scuttled on June 21st, 1919. Unlike the rest of the fleet, or the vast majority anyway, Baden would not sink completely. Some of her crew were busy with a supply ship, and those left aboard, a skeleton of a skeleton crew, could not properly scuttle her. She sank slowly enough that the British were able to drive her to shallower waters. As a result, she was in a position to be easily salvaged. As the sole survivor of the Scapa Flow capital ships, and the most modern German capital ship to boot, Baden was taken in by the Royal Navy. Not as a combat warship of any description, but for testing purposes. Refloated and towed off, the British would spend weeks examining the ship. Everything from her hull form, her screws, and her weaponry. The Royal Navy concluded she was about as efficient, in her hull form, as a revenge-class battleship. Which is arguably fitting, 
as the ship was closer to a revenge than a Queen Elizabeth in design intent. The most important testing, however, revolved around her main battery and her armor protection. The former was tested heavily, as the British ran loading trials on the guns, as well as flooding tests on the magazines. The magazines, as it turned out, could be flooded in 12 minutes. As for the guns, those could be reloaded in 23 seconds, which for the time was remarkably quick. The British themselves, all for fast loading, which did cost them a Jutland, could manage 36 seconds on the Queen Elizabeths. Bonin could reload a full 13 seconds faster, which is impressive by all accounts. For all of this, though, there was never any serious intention to put her in British service. She was a single ship, so sourcing spare parts was going to be difficult, even ignoring that everything was German in design. All the fittings would have had to be exchanged for British ones. Her guns were, again, not exactly 15 inches, so you couldn't just shove British shells and powder bags in them. No, Bowden was fit for only two things once testing was concluded being scrapped, or being expended as a live-fire target ship. In January 1921, the British decided for the latter. Bowden was subjected to hits from the Monitor HMS Terror and her 15-inch guns. These involved both flat trajectories and removing some of her coal and armor from the port side to create an artificial list for testing plunging fire. Terror fired 17 shells of various kinds at Bowden. This would test the effectiveness of the German ship's armor, both in its quality and in its layout. This would also allow the British to test their new shells, developed after the disappointing results at Jutland. These tests would demonstrate that the new shells were far improved from the old ones. They could penetrate Bodden's armor, up to and including the face of one of her turrets. Unfortunately for the German ship here, she was battered enough that heavy seas following the test sank her in shallow water for three months. The British promptly refloated her and towed her to dry dock to effect repairs, just so that she could be fired upon again. One almost feels sorry for Bonin at this point, being dragged out of the water multiple times just to be shot up by her enemy each time. This second set of testing in August 1921 saw the monitor Erebus take over. Her shells would perform rather less well than terrors, as one failed to explode, and two semi-armor-piercing shells shattered on impact. A simulated drop of bombs was performed as well, by placing six aerial bombs against the deck, and detonating them remotely. This also didn't exactly go well, as they did little damage. That being said, all of this testing would, for the most part, serve to confirm what the British were already thinking. That distributed armor was the way of the past, and that all-or-nothing armor, akin to American practice, was the way of the future. The lighter armor aboard Bodden offered no protection against heavy shells, and was just pointless dead weight. As a result, the British would move to all-or-nothing armor. As for Bodden, at the conclusion of the second test, she was towed out to sea, and finally sent to the bottom in late August 1921. She had, in the end proven to be of more use to her enemy than her own nation. Not the greatest fate for a ship, though one can at least say the tests performed upon her were very helpful to the Royal Navy. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.